I'm Giselle. Welcome to Westby. We're launching a brand new Young Adults Life Group starting October 4th at 6.15 p.m. in The Loft. Tim and Mindy Boyd will be leading the way, and we've got pizza for the very first meeting. Join us for connection, conversation, and growth. Got questions? Stop by the Connect Desk or go to groups.westby.org. Foster care is a huge need in Manatee County, and the church must step into the middle of it to shine the light of Jesus Christ. Most people would be happy to step in and help, but they're unsure how the foster system works and the best way to help. On Saturday, October 7th from 9 to 1 p.m., we're going to take a high-level look at the foster care system and empower everyone to find out how God has equipped and called them to serve these kids in need. To learn more or to register, go to foster.westb.org. Let's serve the neighborhood. On Saturday, October 21st, we're going to have a serve day. Our kids' ministry families will be going to parks and playgrounds to hand out invites to Treat Street. Saturday evening, we need volunteers to deliver hot meals to foster families. If you're interested in hearing more or signing up to serve, go to serveday.westb.org. Tree Street is back on Tuesday, October 31st from 6 to 8 p.m. We will have a trunk or treat, games, animals, inflatables, and lots of candy. Join the festivities as we serve our neighborhood as a church family with this fun and safe alternative to trick-or-treating. There are lots of ways to get involved. You can host a trunk, volunteer to help with an inflatable or games, or donate candy. Email brandy at westbradenton.org to reserve a spot for your trunk or to volunteer. Candy can be dropped off in one of the candy buckets located in the commons area. What better way to spend your Halloween than with us serving families in our neighborhood? Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together.
then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and His servants will worship Him, and they will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God, who inspires his prophets, has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw all these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, don't worship me. I am a servant of God, just like you and your brothers, the prophets, as well as all who obey what is written in this book. Worship only God. Then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in this book, for the time is near. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let anyone who hears this say, Come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. Here we are, the last chapter of the Bible, the last sermon in this series. We're in Revelation 22. Get those Bibles out, open them up, turn them on. Here we are going to see God giving us complete assurance. Revelation 22, 6. Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. God's story is a true story. God will complete his story. God's word is inerrant. It is without error. God's word is infallible. It will not lead you astray. God's word is complete. You're not to add or take away from it, as it says in verse 19. And God's word is sufficient. It is all you need. And when you neglect the study of Revelation, or really any of the other 66 books of the Bible, well, any of the other 65 books of the Bible, Revelation makes 66. When you neglect the study of any one part, particularly Revelation, you are getting an 
incomplete picture of God's story. So that's why we, that's why we study the whole of scripture. Revelation 22.10, then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in this book for the time is near. We are commanded by God to explore this book, to attempt to understand the meaning of these texts and to teach the content of the last book of the Bible. Now let's end where we began. As I mentioned, I think it was in the first sermon in this series. Revelation is meant to encourage you, not to scare you. It's, the book is not like the opening to a horror movie. In fact, quite the opposite. Jesus says in that first chapter, chapter 1, verse 17, don't be afraid. The last book of the Bible, Revelation, provides an answer to this question. How is God going to make everything right? I often talk about Habakkuk's cry. It's found in chapter 1, verse 2 of Habakkuk. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. And so Habakkuk's looking around at all the stuff that's wrong in his world, and he's like, God, fix it. Why won't you fix it? I mean, sin has far-reaching impacts. Entire people groups can be wiped out because one tyrant with a lot of power becomes delusional. And, and like Habakkuk, we cry out. We see the stuff in our society. We see the stuff in our world. We're like, God, fix this. And we wonder, why won't God do something? Well, he is. God never holds back any of his love. He's always giving all of his love, but he does hold back his wrath. Why? He's not going to enact all of his justice until the time has come. Now, why does God hold back his wrath, uh, at least until the events of Revelation unfold? And, and the reason is, is because he wants to give people time to get saved in his love God keeps inviting undeserving people like us into his kingdom so that they don't have to experience his wrath. Jesus speaks four times in Revelation 22. Three times he says, I am coming soon. Now let's look at the progression in Revelation 22 of Jesus's words. In verse seven, he says, what? Obey my words. Then verse 12, because I have the power of judgment. So first time he speaks, obey me. Why? Second time he speaks, because I have the power of judgment. Third time he speaks, he says it in verse 16, it's my rightful place to do so. I, I have judgment and it is my right to enact judgment. And then he concludes in verse 20, the fourth time he speaks, I am coming soon. So what should we do now? <laughs> the answer is exactly what Jesus says in Revelation 22, obey, prepare, and share. Obey, prepare, and share. God's truth draws us near through obedience, so we obey him. Why does Jesus tell us to obey the words of prophecy in Revelation? Why does he say that in verse 7? Part of the reason is we have a choice. God gave us a will, as it says in verse 11. Some will do harm, others will be vile, and others will choose to honor God or to live righteously. If you remember this pattern that we've been talking about in the book of Revelation throughout this whole series, you've got judgment and salvation. Judgment for sin, salvation for those who repent. And there's two paths in life, God's righteousness through Christ or sin's unrighteousness. Now, obey in the Greek, I'm talking about the first time that Jesus speaks here and he says, obey my words. Obey in the Greek means to trust. It means to submit. Obey in the Hebrew, which is the Old Testament language, it means to hear. And so listening and obeying go together. These two ideas are linked. Disobedience in the Bible is failure to hear and follow God's word. I failed to hear it and I failed to follow it. And if you don't follow God's path, if you don't get on this path of salvation, on the path of righteousness, you'll just create a God in your own image. And you'll say things like, you know, I think God is this when you should say, I know God is this because of his word. So it's God's word that prepares us for the end of days. The second time Jesus speaks, he, um, it says he brings a reward for those who are prepared. The redeemed are brought into God's presence through the gates of heaven. Unbelievers, those who do not choose salvation are cast 
out of New Jerusalem forever. So the believer is brought in, the unbeliever is cast out. Jesus says, I'm coming back soon. Three times in this chapter, coming back soon. The scarlet thread of the entire Bible is the blood of Christ. That's the theme. The golden thread of the entire Bible, though, is the return of Christ. It is Christ who controls history. He is Lord over history. He will bring history to its proper conclusion. That's exactly what happens in Revelation 22. So God's salvation compels us, and it compels us to share the good news of Jesus. Look at verse 17 here. Anyone who is thirsty can drink from living water. Anyone on the outside right now can be brought into God's kingdom. If you're on the out, you can, you, God is still allowing people in. In fact, that's the promise of Matthew 24, 14. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all the nations will hear it and then the end will come. There is still good news for you. Now, for those of you who are believers, if you care about the end of the story, then you will complete, you will work to complete the story. And so if you care about revelation, if you care about the end of the story, then you will do the work to see that completed. You will be God's ambassador. You, as it says in Matthew chapter 24, you are God's promise to the nations because the gospel will be preached. Psalm 46 reminds us there is only one place to find security. God is our refuge. God is our strength. There's a question here. But where is this secure place with him? Psalm 46.4 tells us a river. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. This same river is found in Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. What's on either side of the river? It says the tree of life. Now, this is important because there were two trees in the Garden of Eden. So again, the end of Revelation pointing us back to the beginning that is in Genesis. There were two trees in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life, which was all about salvation, this perfect relationship with God, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which represents our free will. So we've got the tree of life, that's got salvation, the tree of knowledge and good and evil, which is our free will. Adam and Eve chose the one tree that they weren't supposed to, to, to eat from, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what we ruined in the Garden of Eden is ultimately restored in the Garden of Heaven. Here we see living water flowing. Our access to the tree of life is restored. What we were pushed out of in the Garden of Eden, what we were banished from, is now brought back into the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing profane. There's no more darkness. It's just light forever and ever. Now, if you remember last Christmas, which I'm sure all of you remember everything that I preached from last Christmas. But we talked about this. We discussed this concept of Jesus being light, specifically Jesus being the bright morning star. If you look at verse 16 of Revelation 22, it says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. Jesus is both the source and the heir. The New American Standard Bible says the root and the descendant. I, I like both. I like the New Living Translation and I like the New American Standard Bible. Source and heir, root and descendant. What does that mean? If we're talking about the heir. Well, the Messiah will come from the line of David as prophesied in Isaiah 11. Source, well, Jesus himself is the root of, so he comes from David, but he's also, he's the heir, but he's also the root of this line. He created it. He started it. So Isaiah gives us more details concerning this source and heir of David, and we find that in Isaiah 9. Let me read this to you, verses 6 through 7, just a couple verses here. 
For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor, David, for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. So here in just this short passage, we see a quick glimpse of what is to come in the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, Isaiah 9 has a lot more here, but let's just look at these two verses, a child born. That's the first coming of Christ. There will be a child born. Then you see the government will be on his shoulders. That's the second coming of Christ. So here we see just in these two verses, the first coming and the second coming. And then what does verse seven say here in Isaiah nine? It says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The zeal, the the passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. And what this is telling us is that God is passionate about your peace. He's gonna put the full weight of his power, the full weight of his might, the full weight of heaven behind all of this. It's, it's all, all of who he is, is given to the fulfillment of his promise to save you. And then Jesus says in Revelation, what, what does he say at the end of Revelation? I am the bright morning star. Everyone in the ancient world knew about the bright morning star. It was the brightest spot in the sky after the sun and the moon. You, you couldn't miss it. Um, I've got terrible eyesight. I could, you know, I could probably walk outside and see it. I mean, you can't miss the bright morning star. Poets and artists use the star to um, refer to something standing out. I mean, you can find it in many places, lots of places, places in ancient literature. It's not only in the Bible, it's all over the place. Now, around this time, around the time that John is writing the book of Revelation, ancient scholars discovered the morning star and the evening star was the same celestial body. It wasn't two different bodies. It was the same celestial body. The first star to appear is also the last star to disappear. They're one and the same. How does Jesus describe himself in Revelation 22? Well, specifically verse 13, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alpha, omega, first, last, beginning, end, source, air. Are you seeing a pattern here? Jesus isn't just the brightest star. He's the star that begins and ends it all. In Matthew chapter 2, sometime after Jesus' birth, a group of magi come to recognize the rightful king. We don't know how many magi, uh, but they all come parading in to, to see Jesus. King Herod hears about the Magi and their presence disturbs him. He looks out his window and he sees a parade of Persian kingmakers coming into town and they they ask, you know, we're here for the new king of the Jews. Now, what's Herod's title? Well, he's the king of the Jews. And so he panics and he's, you know, wondering how they all got there. Matthew chapter two, verse two, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. Now, what about this star that guided the Magi to Jesus? It's tough to know. I mean, some say it was an actual star. Others say Jupiter, perhaps a comet or a meteor. Uh, it, It may have been these things. But the reason that we see it here in the text is because it pointed to something greater. Look up to the sky on a clear night before the other stars come out and there's one shining brightly. It's obvious. We know more about this star now. It's fundamentally different than all the other stars in the sky. It's made of rock, not gas. It reflects the sun. The bright morning star is the planet Venus. When John wrote Jesus's words in Revelation, There's no, Jesus knew, but there's no way that John could have known the science behind the bright morning star. That came much later. You know, perhaps he thought it was just as far away as the other stars. In fact, that's likely what he did think, as many at the time did. In reality, the bright morning star, the planet Venus, is 175 
thousand times closer than the next closest star. So this bright morning star is in a class of its own. It's unlike the other stars. It's closer than the other stars. It's brighter than the other stars. Categorically different. Jesus is brighter than you can imagine. Jesus is closer than you realize. Psalm 8, verse 3 through 4 says what? When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that, sh that you should think about them, human beings, that you should care for them? The one who begins and ends it all cares deeply for you. Look up. Follow the star. Follow the light of the world. And look ahead. Follow the living water. When will we get there? So you're following the, the bright morning star. You're, you're following the, the river of life. When are we going to get there? Jesus, encour Jesus encourages us in Revelation 22. What does Jesus say? I am coming soon. Get ready, church. He is returning. He will return. And I pray you are ready. Thank you for worshiping through our digital service. Please visit us at westb.org for more information about our church.